News Central now at this hour begins in Nigeria with legal matters where a group of about 30 lawmakers in the House of Representatives are seeking alterations to the 1999 constitution to pave the way for the rotation of presidency among the six geopolitical zones of the country. They also want an amendment to the constitution to provide for a single tenure of six years for the president and governors of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, speaking on behalf of the group on Monday in Abuja, the member representing Ideato South, Ideato North Federal Constituency, Imo State, Ikenga Ogochinyere, said this will help ensure a reduction in the cost of governance and campaigns, unite the country, and bring about uninterrupted development. Now, staying with legal issues, let's head to River State, where the State High Court has declared that Martin Amaule and 26 pro wk lawmakers are still members of the People's Democratic Party. The court, in a ruling on Monday, struck out a suit filed by Wosa Amadi and three others seeking to declare the seats of the 27 lawmakers vacant following their defection to the All Progressives Congress. In this judgment, the presiding judge, Justice Okobuleg Basam, ruled that Martin Amaule and the 26 other lawmakers are still members of the PDP. Justice Basam also ruled that the claimants failed to prove to the court that the 27 lawmakers truly defected to the APC, noting that the said defection cannot be established through newspaper publications, radio announcements, or online publications. According to the court, a defection can only be established through the party membership register, a membership card, and such members fulfilling all requirements of their membership in the party. Meanwhile, River State Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Dagogo Israel Iboroma, says only a federal high court can determine whether Martins, Amawule, and 26 other lawmakers are still members of the PDP and the River State House of Assembly. Iboroma urged the public to disregard a state high court judgment, making the rounds that Martins and 26 other lawmakers who had earlier defected from the PDP to the APC are still members of the PDP. Now, according to the judgment, the said defection of the 26 lawmakers, or 27 lawmakers rather, cannot be established through newspaper publication, radio announcements, or online publications. However, Iboroma said in a pending suit, their defection on the 11th of December 2023 is captured in a fit of fit evidence deposed by a uh, two by a Maule for himself and on behalf of the others before a federal high court in Abuja. Now to discuss this, we're joined by a legal practitioner, Eugene Ode, and he joins us from River State. Hello, Eugene. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me. All right, Eugene. Now, the Attorney General argues a federal high court has jurisdiction while a state high court issued the judgment. Now, can you analyze the legal basis for which court has authority in this case, you know, involving party membership and assembly seats? Well, who best to resolve this uh, controversy region um, with regards to the commission, which is beginning to uh, look like the misinformation or disinformation um, that uh, was probably targeted at misleading um, citizens of the um, Federal Republic. Um, that's having been said, the issue of um, jurisdiction is very paramount in determining the rights of parties before the courts. And that is what the court uh, has done today, to determine whether it had the jurisdiction to determine the issues that were brought before uh, it for adjudication. You know, because jurisdiction is very paramount. It is like um, the cloak, the cloth that covers um, the courts. That is what empowers the courts to determine the issues that are before it. When a court lacks jurisdiction, it cannot proceed to determine whatever is before it. And the, this issue of jurisdiction has been um, settled <coughs> by Section 272, Subject Section 3, 
of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended as to who has the power to determine. Okay, now in addition, Eugene. Tenure Yes, in addition, the State High Court's judgment uh, reportedly views newspaper publications as insufficient proof of defection. Now, how does this viewpoint compare to typical legal standards for establishing defection from a political party? Except maybe we're just having this conversation for academic purposes. Otherwise, um, the issue that we're generated from the contents of the purported judgment as was uh, earlier published, which has, we have now found out that uh, was false, you know, um, the issue of the defection was a notorious fact. Now, whether it was published in the newspapers or not, the fact that it was a subject of deliberation during plenary, you know, um, gives the courts the power, okay, to take judicial notice of whatever transpire, transpired um, on the floor of the River State House of Assembly on the fateful day when that um, infection was announced, irrespective of newspaper publication. But to say that newspaper publications and media publication has no role in um, determining whether or not this people defected, I don't think that is actually correct. Well, like I said, this is an academic discussion it has nothing to do with the purported judgment because there was no such judgment. Okay. Now, facts to be said to be notorious when everybody within the locality has become a infection of the 27 lawmakers from the River State House of Assembly from the PDP to the APC was so notorious, okay, because it was published widely in both electronic and the print media, including social media, not just by the media houses themselves, but even by the 27 lawmakers themselves. We saw pictures and videos of them celebrating their defection. And by Section 122 of the Evidence Act, these are facts which any has the power to take judicial notice of. Now, like I told you, even if the court decides that it's not going to countenance this super publication, what about the activities that took place during plenary when the speaker, the then speaker himself? Well, well the, the attorney general the also House. mentioned, you know, uh, Amaule's affidavit in a federal court, you know, claiming defection. Uh, do you think this affidavit contradicts any previous filings or statements made by uh, Amaule or the other lawmakers regarding their party affiliation? You know what is interesting in the whole of this thing? There is no material particular, either in the media or in the courts, where these 27 lawmakers have denied their defection. It is only the PDP that is denying, or the APC, or Prox, or their lawyers. But the 27 lawmakers themselves have not, by any instrument whatsoever, whatsoever, come out openly to deny that they did not defect from the PDP. This is common knowledge to everybody, including the courts. Where, or if there's any document or any publication where these 27 lawmakers have come out to say they are still members of PDP and they never challenge their handlers to make it known, even to you, the media people. The, the Honorable Attorney General of River State was um, accurate when he stated that the 27 lawmakers are actually in court at the Federal High Court in Abuja. In fact, that matter was commenced by a writ of summons where they filed statements of claim, okay? And in that statement of claim, they avowed and gave reasons as to why they left speech. Notice, seeking interlocutory orders of the Federal High Court to restrain INEC Their, uh, their positions, because according to them, their defection was in line with the provisions of um, um, Section 109, Subsection 1, Paragraph G, particularly the proviso, which is the fact that they were claiming that there was there was division, and they took advantage of that division in PDP when while they defected. That is the position of the 27 lawmakers, both in court and in court. You cannot cry more than the bereaved. I don't okay. think PDP would come out now to begin to cry 
more than the 27 right. lawmakers right, who have since uh, jumped ship. All right, uh, just to wrap up, you know, this uh, conversation, uh, the disputes involving lawmakers potentially switching parties. Now, how do you think this situation affects the balance of power within the reverse state House of Assembly and also influence upcoming political actions? Now, what is important is that you should be aware There is balance of power. That's not a challenge. That's not a problem. There are now members of the House of Assembly who are holding forth. A new speaker has been elected, and the speaker has been piloting the affairs of the House of Assembly and has been working, you know, in collaboration with um, the executive arm of government and the judiciary to move the state forward. I believe you are aware that some laws have already been passed. In fact, one of the first things that um, he did when he came, um, this new, I mean, the House of Assembly, the first thing they did was to annul and abrogate every law that was, that was passed by the 27 lawmakers during this period when there was uh, seemingly lacuna in the in the leadership of the House of Assembly. And those, those are far-reaching decisions, and several other decisions have been taken by the House of Assembly. The current House of Assembly has led by the new speaker, okay? <clears throat> and has received the endorsement of the governor of the state. So there is no, there is no problem. The system is uh, working seamlessly. Okay. And I believe that uh, in due course, everything will be resolved, both politically and judicially. All right, that's good to hear. Well, thank you so much, Eugene, for joining us and speaking on this. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has opened its case against former Minister of Aviation Hadi Sirika by calling its first witness Azubuike Okori. Okori, a subpoenaed witness, is the former Director of Procurement of the Federal Ministry of Aviation. He was thereafter appointed Special Assistant to the former Minister. The case has been adjourned to Tuesday for continuation of hearing and Sirica, alongside his daughter, son-in-law, and Aldirac Investment Limited, are facing a six-count charge of fraud to the tune of 7.2 billion naira in connection with the Nigerian Air Project. The only thing I can tell you is that we will open our case today, and they ask for time to examine the witness. It's not for, for, for lawyers to watch the opinion of witnesses. The news returns shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now to Labour Matters. As the one-week ultimatum given to the federal government by the Nigeria Labour Congress and Trade Union Congress gradually comes to an end, Questions concerning what Labour's next actions will be are being asked. Over the weekend, the federal government agreed to pay 62,000 naira as minimum wage against the 250,000 naira requested by Labour. However, state governors said they cannot pay 60,000 naira. News Central's Bernard Akede has more. Get in. After shutting down various sectors of the country, including power, health and domestic airports for two weeks, while fighting for an increment in the national minimum wage, the NLC and TUC agreed to suspend their industrial action for the next one week, as it seemed negotiations with the government would yield positive results. But having agreed to bring down the previously demanded wages from over 400,000 to 250,000 naira, the federal government has said it can only afford 62,000 naira, while the state governors say they cannot even afford 60,000 naira. The question now is, if the NLC accepts the government's offer, will they be seen as reasonable or weak? So if NLC accepts this, it will be uh, because maybe they are not serious, they, they didn't organize themselves properly, or... Generally, they didn't have a strong foot. If you come all the way from ninety um, for four hundred and ninety-four thousand and almost five hundred thousand naira to um, sixty-two thousand naira, you agree to that, then there's a very big problem. 
I would still want to push for 70,000, 80,000. But 60,000 share enough is something to start start up with. And I believe that Nebo doesn't need to come out negotiating again. The NLC has for long been accused of being reactive rather than proactive. And besides fighting for just wages increment, other variables should have been demanded for. Being removed when subsidies on education were being removed, they, they should have made some demand then, which they did not. However, now that they are um, fighting for salary increase, I think they should focus on salary increase alone. If they start mentioning all sorts of things, palliatives and um, health insurance, it would just, you know, remove their focus from what they are demanding. But even if the government were to raise the minimum wage to the NLC's desired amount, would that be a final solution to the problems at hand? We need to look at a lot of things, not just about increasing the money, because increasing the money at some point will cause a bit of cash pool inflation. So we need to make sure how we check those economic and put it in place, the economic indices, you know, come to bear that is 60,000 now. As the clock ticks to the expiration of the ultimatum the NLC gave the government, all Nigerians can do now is to wait and see if Labour will accept the government's offer or pick up the strike from where they left off. In Lagos for New Central, I'm Bernard Akede. Thank you, Bernard, for that report. Now, away from that, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has denied media reports alleging that it inflated fuel subsidy payments by 3.3 trillion naira. A forensic audit by KPMG reportedly found significant discrepancies in NNPCL's subsidy claims from 2015 to 2021. On Monday, Chief Corporate Communications Officer of the NNPCL, Olufemi Shoneye, said the company has never inflated subsidy claims. He also emphasized that all subsidy claims are verifiable with all relevant records and documents submitted to authorities for audit. NNPCL maintains it operates account accountably and transparently adhering to international best practices. International financiers that are meant to fund the construction of about 20 modular refineries in Nigeria have withheld their funds due to the challenge of getting guarantees for crude oil supply to the facilities when they are completed. The majority of foreign oil corporations that produce crude oil in Nigeria have not been able to promise financiers that crude oil will be provided to the modular refineries when the facilities are ready to produce refined petroleum products. Now, based on this, those who funded the facilities withheld their money pending when the federal government would persuade IOCs to give the assurances necessary for the supply of crude oil to modular refiners. Earlier, Temi Tokwe Kolade, Senior Manager and Lead ESG in Climate Change Services at Anderson spoke to us on this development. Indigenous producers of uh, petroleum, um, I mean crude oil in itself, and so those should not really be uh, some sort of alternatives, but the chances are very limited other than uh, the fact that we have IOCs and the indigenous producers. Uh, you would have to probably talk about importing uh, crude into Nigeria, which is going to come at its own uh, cost as well. Uh, we know that in the past, in the recent past, Dangote had, had to look out of Nigeria to even get uh, crude oil to, 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 to get his refinery working, for instance. So, uh, the implication of this is that, again, if uh, these modular refineries, which are smaller, uh, have to do this, it's going to be a very... The chairperson of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, NITCOM, Abiker Dabiri Erewa, has confirmed the arrest of a suspect who allegedly trafficked young girls to Ghana as sex workers. The NITCOM boss also mentioned that more than 10 girls have been rescued so far, commending the efforts by the Nigerians in the diaspora organization in Ghana for leading the raid that led to the arrest of the suspects. New Central's Bettina Angweli reports. 
The National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons and Other Related Matters has launched an investigation into the circumstances behind the viral video of minors who were allegedly trafficked to Ghana, including three siblings from the same parents. The statistics is of an all-time high, doubled with insecurity, which a lot of areas in the country is currently facing. So be it human organ trafficking, uh, or child labor, or sex, tra or sex trafficking. So it's a big issue now. And the major contributing factor is the hardship in the country and insecurity. According to a report from the U.S. Department of State on trafficking in Nigeria, traffickers exploit victims in sex trafficking as well as in forced and bonded labor, in street vending, and domestic services. Nigerian perpetrators are known to recruit victims from rural areas especially the country's southern regions, for exploitation. Those most vulnerable to trafficking include people from rural communities, IDPs, irregular migrants, those working in the informal economy, and those with disabilities. However, there are signs to show that you are being groomed for trafficking. Telltale signs is if all the financial requirements are being handled by the person who is promising you the traffic a big red flag, where you don't have to bring in any money at all. The second thing is when you are not sure of what kind of job they are going to do. And lastly, most of the times, people that are susceptible to be groomed for trafficking don't have any tangible skills. They are not educated, they don't have education. Most times, they're underaged, or sometimes they might even be like artisans. Human trafficking is not only an injustice to the victim, it is also an injustice unto the families and humanity. Stakeholders are advocating for stiffer penalties for perpetrators of human trafficking, and it is hoped that those at the helm of power will take heed sooner than later in order to curb this embarrassing menace of human trafficking. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Unwili. Thank you, Bettina, for that report. The federal government is currently facing a backlash following the recent inauguration of a 21 billion Naira vice presidential residence amidst the economic hardship in the country. Now, the project, which just entered completion, was awarded in 2010 at a 7 billion Naira and passed through two administrations before completion 14 years later. New Central's Adeshawa Dushoga has more on this report. 14 years after the contract was first inaugurated, the vice president's official quarters have now been completed. The vice president's residence was first awarded in 2010, during the President Goodluck Jonathan era, at the cost of 7 billion naira, but was abandoned in 2015 during the administration of President Muhammad Buhari only to be completed in the President Bola Tinubu's administration for 21 billion naira. Rather than dwell on past shortcomings, we have chosen to seize this opportunity to demonstrate our resolve to compound obstacles head on and deliver on the promises made to the Nigerian people. A vice president residence, federal government, Nigeria, the giant of Africa, awarded a contract for number two citizen to reside, to do his work 14 years ago. It is important to note that this administration had equally as part of its supplementary budget requested an additional 2.5 billion naira for the renovation of the former vice president's residence before the completion of the new one. This recent spending by the federal government amidst the current economic hardship in the country and the demands of an increase in minimum wage begs the question, what is the priority of this administration? With, with, uh, with a government that is asking Nigerians to tighten its belt, more, more hardship will come because of you know, economic policies to turn us around on better grounds, on solid grounds. I think it should as well sacrifice its comfort for Nigerians, but it shows you that while we are tightening our belts across the country, they are loosening their belts because they are getting fatter, because they are feeding fat on our natural resources. 
During the inauguration, the vice president said the administration is dedicated to the efficient utilization of resources for the betterment of the nation. But it appears Nigerians do not share the same view. I mean, 21 billion naira for the situation of this country now is not palatable at all. Because things is not going well. People are complaining. The economy is in hardship. You know, uh, to implement a good management policy, that is not the way to start from. That money, that money can be put into a lot of things. Maybe a lot of hospitals are not working. We know a lot of things are not in order. And even minimum wage that, <laughs> that they've not even done anything about it. And yet they are taking 20, how much? 21 billion. What do we care, be? <laughs> The vice president's official residence is the eight FCT critical project so far inaugurated by the president Tinubu led administration in one year. In Lagos, for News Central, Adishawa Dushoga. Coming up after the break. South Africa Parliament meets Friday to elect president. We'll tell you more after the break. Join us again. We now head to Southern Africa, where an aircraft carrying Malawi's Vice President, Solos Chilima, and nine others has gone missing. A statement from the president's office said the Malawi Defense Force aircraft went off the radar after it left the capital Lilongwe on Monday morning. President Lazarus Jaquera has ordered a search and rescue operation after aviation officials were unable to contact the aircraft, which was supposed to land at Nzuzu International Airport in the country's north just after 10 a.m. local time. After being informed of the incident, Taquera cancelled his scheduled flight to the Bahamas. Now, we head to South Africa, where the newly elected parliament is to convene for the first time on Friday as political parties scramble to form a coalition after the general elections produced no outright winner. Lawmakers in the 400-seat National Assembly will be called to appoint a speaker and start the process of electing the country's president, a task that could prove trickier than usual this year. For the first time since the advent of democracy in 1994, President Cyril Ramaphosa's African National Congress lost its absolute parliamentary majority in the May 29 vote. The ANC has already indicated it wants to form a government of national unity with a broad group of opposition parties ranging from the far right to the hard left. Social media came abuzz last week when a video emerged of Zimbabwe's President Emerson Nangwagwa expressing his concern to Russia's President Vladimir Putin regarding the preferential treatment Western nations gave to Zambia through military and financial aid. Nangagwa, who is set to take over the SADC chairmanship this year, insinuated that Zambia is a Western puppet that Moscow must combat. Now, in a meeting with Putin at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in Russia, Nangagwa said the United States is consolidating its power in Zambia to isolate Zimbabwe. Meanwhile, Zambians have expressed disappointment in Nangagwa and called, him for an, and called him an irresponsible leader. Zambia and several African countries are close to the U.S. and other Western democracies, while Zimbabwe and South Africa are allies of China and Russia, which are under authoritarian governments. Just began consolidating their power in Zambia, our next neighbor. You know, there was a time when Zambia and Zimbabwe were one. It was called Northern and Southern Rhodesia. It was one by the British, but they were now separate. And the, the Americans are consolidating their power in that country, both in terms of security and in terms of uh, financial support to Zambia, to make sure that we feel lonely. But that will not change us because we have taken a course which, as, as, as a people that we feel to discuss this, we're joined by two gentlemen, 
A political analyst, Edwin Yingi, he joins us from Hauteng, uh, South Africa. And also joining us uh, for more on this is an activist, Joseph Kalibwe. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at this time. All right, let's begin with you, uh, Edwin. Thank you. All right, let's begin with you, Edwin. Now, what do you think motivated President Nangagwa to inform President Putin, you know, that Zambia is a security threat? And how does this reflect on Zimbabwe's relationship with its regional neighbors? Uh, thank you for having me. And um, uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, I would start by saying uh, that... Um, uh, this uh, attitude of President Munangagwa and um, his utterances uh, to his worst, uh, President Putin of Russia, is an indication of uh, the failure of his re-engagement with the West. Uh, when President Munangagwa took over in 2018, uh, he embarked on what he called re-engagement with the West and uh, with uh, the United States of America. Uh, he made efforts uh, to have sanctions uh, removed by the United States and also have sanctions removed by the European Union mm. and also to have him readmitted in the Commonwealth. And those efforts have not produced any meaningful results. And now he is uh, going back to the East he is trying to consolidate his relations with the, with the East. Mm. So that is the first, the first reason. The second reason is that uh, President Munangagwa and his uh, ZANU-PF party uh, seem to be losing friends in the, in the region. And uh, the immediate uh, trigger to his uh, uh, behavior is uh, the loss of elections in the in South Africa by the ANC. ANC has been a very strong backer of the regime in Zimbabwe. And All right, now Edwin. ANC has lost. Uh, uh, Edwin, uh, just a minute. Let's uh, hear from uh, Joseph there. Now, Joseph, uh, could you tell us how have Zimbabweans, you know, uh, that Zambians, I beg your pardon, you know, responded to the news? of their neighbor, you know, Zimbabwe, labeling them a security threat. You know, are there any concerns or anxieties uh, about the implications of this move? Well, of course, of course, so many people in our country are concerned because our nation has always um, stood firm to ensure that we protect uh, uh, our integrity and that uh, we help ensure that uh, Zambia becomes a beacon of peace that it has always been. And so when you get accused of things that have no baseline of facts whatsoever, it's, it's a source of concern because if you look closely, over many years, our nation has been um, peaceful. We have always advocated for peace. And so those remarks that we watched in that clip were very, very unfortunate. And uh, our people are concerned because there's been a lot of attacks coming from the other side over the past months. This is not the first time. There's been a lot of um, untold attacks and threats coming from from the regime in Harare on our leadership in Osaka, which is very unfortunate. Okay. Now, uh, back to you, uh, Edwin. Now, just before Joseph spoke, uh, you know, you were talking to us about uh, some of the reasons why, uh, you know, uh, Zambia would be labeled as a threat. But how do you think that this development will impact diplomatic ties between Zambia and Zimbabwe? And what uh, do you think would be the potential consequences for regional cooperation? Uh, to, to, to answer your question, um, I would say this is not the first time we have seen the, fo uh, the falling out of, uh, or the diplomatic fallout between Zambia and Zimbabwe uh, in recent years. Just last year, uh, there was uh, a, a bit of a fallout uh, when uh, Zimbabwe had its, its elections and um, uh, a report by, by the SADC head uh, of um, electoral uh, observation mission uh, was very scathing to the elections in Zimbabwe. And that uh, created a, a serious diplomatic uh, friction between Zimbabwe and, uh, and, um, and Zambia. So this is not the first, this is not the first time. And uh, the implications of 
this recent event, I, I, I see tensions uh, going up. We are having a SADAC, um, uh, we are having a, a, a SADAC conference coming in August uh, and in Zimbabwe, and uh, 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 and President Mnangawa is taking over the chairmanship of, of, of SADAC as from August 2024. So I see uh, tensions rising between between the two the, between the two countries, given the latest the latest uh, events. But this is not the first time since last year we have had such kind of such kind of friction between the two countries. All right, back to you now, Joseph. Uh, now tell us, do you believe that Zambia's decision to uh, allow a military a military base on its soil was a legitimate move and? Uh, do, or do you think it actually created some uh, tension between, you know, uh, its neighbors or is creating tension between its neighbors? Well, first of all, let me correct the narrative that Zambia has allowed a, a base in its, uh, in its territory. That is not true. Uh, that is um, the misinformation that is being spread by our opponents, particularly those that feel Zambia is more aligned to the West. There's no military base in our country. It has never existed and it will never exist. The only military bases that are in Zambia are the Zambia Army military bases. There's no military base uh, of foreign nationals or foreign countries uh, in our country. So I wanted to correct that narrative. Right. There's nothing like a, a U.S. military base in Zambia. And even from the very beginning, we've always stated that uh, that does not exist and it's purely political propaganda being spread by those that seek to see us fail. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, that uh, correction. Now, uh, Edwin, talking about the move by President Nangagwa, you know, uh, would you say it is a sign of increased tension, you know, following the disputed elections? Because you're actually talking about uh, the elections in South Africa. Uh, would you say that, uh, you know, it is a sign following disputed elections by the leader of election observer from Zambia, uh, and how might it affect the Southern African development community as a whole? I, I, would, I would say... Hello. Okay, Edwin, we seem to uh, have network issues with you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Edwin. But then let's uh, wrap it up with Joseph here. Now, how does this development, Joseph, affect Zambians' perception of their relationship with Zimbabwe? Because you did say earlier that uh, it has caused you know, a bit of tension with Zambians, you know, uh, particularly in terms of trust and also cooperation of both countries. Well, first of all, let me say, and let me say it very explicitly, that Zambia does not have uh, any EU feelings. Our people in Zambia don't have any EU feelings in terms of what is uh, being said. If you look very closely, Zambians don't even respond to so many things that is being said by the Zimbabweans. They're the ones who say things every single time. They attack our president. They attack Zambians. They say so many things. And in return, what have we done? Zambians have not responded. They don't uh, respond to that because we believe in peace and we think... Uh, Having to respond to baseless uh, uh, arguments and claims could lead, to could lead to further tension, and we cannot be able to do that. So, uh, like I said, uh, we have been very clear and we've not been responsive to all the things that have been said. Let me be also very clear that the video that came out, uh, the government uh, said they're studying the video and they want to confirm um, whether the video is original or not. That is uh, what was said by the ambassador of Zambia to Zimbabwe. And we're hoping that we can come to a conclusive end, unlike uh, the threats and the political arguments that are coming from the other end. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joseph, for your time. And thank you so much, you. Edwin. I can see we have you back. Well, let's head to business now, where Nigerian airlines are still grappling with operational challenges as they work to accommodate passengers and clear the backlog caused by the recent strike embarked on by the Nigeria Labour Congress and Trade Union Congress to press their demand for the implementation of a new national minimum wage. Although the strike was momentarily suspended, it disrupted flight schedules and caused logistics issues for several airlines. Olumide Ohunayo, General Secretary, Aviation Safety Roundtable, joined us on Business Edge and explained the reality. I think 
the domestic um, airlines had more had more impact with that strike than the international carriers uh, because for international carriers the unions give them 48 hours to plan uh, uh that they were going to come to the airport on tuesday uh, but, uh, but, but by, by tuesday when they were about to close the international airport they had uh, called up the strike but then uh, some of the uh, international carriers had already scheduled we scheduled one, uh, one or two flights so uh, it wasn't as, as impactful as it had on the domestic airlines and um, like you said your analysis we are still going through the backlog and the and the backlash of, 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 of the strike. Uh, the, the airlines are yet to get some of those airlines, some of the passengers, as whose flights were cancelled back on the uh, scheduled them on another flight, and that's why flights are so expensive now. If you walk straight to the airport to pick a ticket now, you must have nothing less than about twenty thousand naira. In the world of sports, the Super Eagles are presently facing Benin Republic in a crucial 2026 World Cup qualifying match at the state Felix Hufet Bogni Stadium in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. Now, as at the time of this report, the Super Eagles are presently losing two goals to one against the Squirrels of Benin. The match is a must-win game for the Eagles as they currently sit in fifth position in Group C of the World Cup qualification with three points from three consecutive draws. We'll bring you further updates in our subsequent bulletins as we track the progress of this pivotal match. Nigeria's duo of Udodi Onguzurike and Favor Ofili dominated the men's and women's the men and women's 100 meter event at the US ATF NYC Grand Prix in New York City, United States. Udodi won the men's 100 meters at the US ATF NYC Grand Prix, clocking a time of 10 10.24 seconds, beating Kendall Williams of the USA, who finished with a time of 10.25 seconds. PJ Austin came in third with 10.26 seconds. Meanwhile, Ophili won the women's event with a time of 11.18 seconds, holding off competition from Morolake Akinosun, who finished with a time of 11.21 seconds, and her U.S. compatriots Alea Hobbs and Thomas and Thomas Moralake, who finished third with a time of 11.34 seconds. Three Valencia fans have been sentenced to eight months in prison, the first conviction for racism at a football match in Spain as a direct result of a complaint filed by La Liga. The racist chants were aimed at Real Madrid forward Vinicius Jr. during a La Liga game at Valencia's Mestala Stadium on 21st of May 2023. The fans were found guilty of a crime against moral integrity with aggravating circumstance of discrimination based on racist motives. An initial 12-month sentence was reduced by a third following an agreement reached at the preliminary investigation stage. The fans were also banned from entering any football stadium in which La Liga and or Spanish Football Federation matches are played for a period of three years, later reduced to two. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our top stories. We told you that members of Nigeria's House of Representatives seek six-year tenure for president rotation among zones. We also told you that drama as reverse attorney general dismisses court ruling declaring 27 pro wk lawmakers as PDP members. Finally, you heard that plane carrying Malawi vice president goes missing. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.